Good morning. My name is Aleksandra Borowicz and I'm assistant professor at the University of Gdańsk. Today, I would like to welcome you on the webinar, Poland's success in the area of international trade and FDI determinants and prospects. The webinar is organized within the project Balkans Ambitions and Polish Inspiration, which is financed by Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Poland. First of all, I would address my special warm greetings uh, to my distinguished guests who accepted invitation for today's event. And I will introduce them in alphabetic order, starting with Professor Małgosia Dziembała from University of Economics in Katowice. She is habilitated doctor in economic sciences, head of Department of International Economic Relations at the University in Katowice. She conducts research concerning the economic policy of the EU, including the cohesion policy, competitiveness of regions, innovation, and international cooperation of regions. She is an author of many scientific publications, including books and scientific articles. Thank you, Professor Jimbawa, for acceptance of my invitation for today's meeting. Our second guest is Wojciech Tyborowski. He is director of the Investor Assistance Center in the Pomerania, uh, which is the part of Polish Investment and Trade Agency, experienced project manager. He conducted projects in ABSL Academy, and he was a project manager in Invest in Pomerania project. He graduated from the University of Dan, which is especially uh, nice to see him today on our webinar. Thank you, Director Tyborowski, for your presence today. And finally, last but not least, of course, my colleague from University of Gdańsk, Professor Stanisław Umiński, who is also habilitated doctor at the Department of International Economics and Economic Development at the University of Gdańsk. He is a board member of the Institute of Development in Sopot, an expert in the field of European integration, foreign direct investment, and international trade with a special focus on regional aspects. He is an author of numerous scientific publications, including prestigious scientific journals. Thank you very much uh, for accepting my invitation for today's meeting. So I will start uh, slowly and move to uh, our two topics, which is the international trade and FDI. Poland joined the EU in 2004, and the membership in European Union is treated as a milestone on our path of economic development. But to be honest, the revolution in the area of trade and foreign direct investment in Poland already started in the 90s when Polish economy opened. The next steps, which brought us closer to Western countries, heavily impacted the situation in trade in a positive way, but also introduced to entrepreneurs especially many challenges. Since 90s, as you can see on the data, uh, the export of goods rose around 15 times, whereas import of goods 13 times, starting in 1995. The second topic of our today discussion are the foreign direct investment, which are extremely important for economic development, especially in the case of transforming economies. The presence of foreign investors in, um, is a one of the key elements for the development in a competitive, for a competitive exports. They play important role as the Central Statistical Office of Poland reveals that the entities with foreign capital res uh, are responsible for uh, circa about 60% of Polish uh, exports. Poland keeps the leading uh, role as a recipient of the inflow of foreign direct investment, uh, and Poland occupies very high positions in global and European uh, rankings in terms of investment attractiveness. Uh, the attractiveness of Poland in terms of the size of market, access to the qualified workforce, cultural proximity, uh, significantly contributes to the continued interest in the Polish market as a place to locate investment. So on this basis of those general remarks, I hope that we will find some answers to uh, questions today, which we will share with our listeners. In the first part, I will try to target my questions uh, three to our distinguished guests. And I will start with Professor Jimbawa. Can you please tell us how did the process of Poland's integration with EU shape the competitiveness of Polish trade? Uh, so th thank you. Thank you, Alexandra, for your kind invitation to the discussion. It's my pleasure to be here. And to uh, start with, with the topic, uh, let me give you a summary of the background for, for the development of trade relations between Poland and, in fact, the European Union. Uh, so, in fact, uh, as, as you mentioned, um, the Poland's integration started in the 90s 
1991, let me, let me uh, tell you that the association agreement with the European communities was uh, signed, so-called Europe Agreement. Uh, the treaty came into force uh, on the 1st of February 1994. However, its uh, commercial part uh, included in the, in, in the interim, interim agreement came into force on the 1st of March 1992. And what was the objective of the Europe Agreement? So just to facilitate the increase of trade and to accelerate the restructuring of the economy, to increase the stability of the economic rules, and also to assure the political security of the country. The agreement covered provisions, rela provisions related to many fields, not only the political dialogue, but also that's why mutual trade relations, including creation of the free trade area in industrial products, also the movement of services, free movement of services, labor force capital, and setting up uh, enterprises. And uh, also, so the most important from our, uh, from our discussion was this commercial part, uh, because it focused on the liberalization. So there were some provisions related to agri non-agricultural products and also agricultural products, but uh, let's, focus, uh, let's focus on the non-agricultural products uh, because they are shared uh, in, uh, in Polish exports and imports uh, from the EU amounted to over 80%. Uh, so the Europe agreement uh, covered creation of the free trade area and thus elimination of all barriers, namely duties, quantitative restrictions and other barriers. There were some rules that applied, namely the standstill rule, uh, also the asymmetry rule and the first liberalization uh, covers more than 40% of Polish exports and started as of the 1st of March, 1992. And uh, so, of course, uh, the process of liber liberalization was, was quite long. Uh, however, uh, it enabled us uh, to en enable Poland to get access to the community market and also, uh, also uh, the community get, uh, got the access to, to the market of Poland. So what, what were the effects of the first, let's say, first integration before the accession? Uh, so uh, as a result, in 2002, the EU share in Polish exports uh, amounted to 70% in imports, uh, of course, uh, in imports about uh, more than 60%. And uh, also uh, Poland beca uh, became very quite important partner for uh, for, 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 uh, for, for, for EU and uh, also, uh, and, uh, also uh, uh, this role started, started to increase. However, what we observed, we observed the, uh, the trade deficit, uh, the trade deficit with trade with European communities, while um, because this trade deficit um, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was as a result of the growing demand of the high growth rate in, in, of Poland and growing demand for just for, for several production for products, mainly for capital goods, uh, as, as well as the other goods, just uh, which, are, which are necessary to modernize the Polish economy. And also, uh, to, and also uh, this, in, in this import was uh, also um, uh, uh, facilitated uh, due, to the due to foreign direct investments because of course, uh, uh, investors uh, started in the, in the 90s started to invest a lot and they need uh, some products to start their production. And of course, uh, so uh, we observed some positive, some positive effects uh, just before the accession. And what happened after the accession? So just uh, Poland's accession uh, in the EU took place in 2000 and 2004 and implies uh, the inclusion uh, of Poland into the single European market, and also accept, uh, it was uh, uh, also related to the acceptance of all rules and instruments of the common trade policy towards the third countries. As a result, we adopted the common customs tariff and the trade policy, which uh, since then have, uh, has been conducted on the community level. Uh, on the community level, and uh, as I mentioned, the accession means. Uh, that the common rules of uh, free movement of com commodities uh, were, ado uh, uh, were adopted, namely uh, further removal of tariffs uh, were 
uh, where, uh, where removal was implemented, uh, so some elimination of any quantitative restrictions, uh, removal of anti-dumping duties, and what was important, removal of physical, technical, and fiscal barriers related to crossing the border. And so, just to sum up, what about the uh, what about the effects? Uh, for um, what 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 I can say that uh, the years after accession were very positive, both in terms of both uh, as Alexandra said, in terms of dynamics of the Polish exports and uh, imports, uh, because uh, uh, because as a result, the Polish exports. Uh, in uh, just in two, two, uh, 2018 was more than three times higher than in 2004, and the same about uh, import. And what we observe also uh, the, uh, the effects of trade uh, creation and trade diversion. Yes, so it means what, so uh, what, what it means that the new uh, flows of trade uh, um, appeared mainly also uh, within the EU, with the EU 15 and with the 10 EU member states, so further no, further called as the EU 10, and also uh, uh, also the share uh, of EU in uh, Polish exports and imports um, was was very, the share uh, is very high. Just uh, uh, if you if you if you give you the data, so in 2019. Uh, uh, the share of EU uh, in terms of in Polish uh, imports amounted to uh, amounted to 58 percentage, and in terms of exports, about 80 80 uh, 80 percent. And of course, uh, there were uh, some rules, uh, some changes concerning uh, uh, concerning the uh, access to the EU market. Also, as we uh, as we uh, as we noticed the. Mm, the trade uh, started. The trade uh, was very. Uh, the trade turnover was uh, and trade was very dynamic, as as well. And uh, we established uh, long long term relationship uh, with the with the EU member EU member states. And also, uh, mm, not um, uh, what about? Of course, the question is what about uh, uh, our products if we are competitive. Uh, within the EU on the EU market. So um, according to some, uh, so Poland has the competitive, um, this, uh, the situation uh, is not very promising uh, because the, the Poland has the competitive advantage uh, in trade uh, in community groups such as beverages and tobacco, and miscellaneous uh, manufacture articles, manufacture goods classified chiefly by material, food and live animals, and um, this is at what uh, this is what we have at the moment. And uh, what we observe that Poland specialization has slightly changed since the accession to the EU, uh, gain in trade in beverages and tobacco, has uh, improved in food and live animals. But um, according some to some estimates, they're losing the advantages in manufacture goods. Uh, so uh, so of course. Uh, what was observed that Poland's specialization is not moving towards uh, towards innovative commodities, rather uh, rather in trade, rather in basic labor-intensive ones. So this is uh, this is a challenge uh, for our uh, for, uh, this is a challenge uh, to change and to modernize um, the the commodity structure of our export. And also, uh, however, uh, the Poland is very open. Is, is becoming a very open country, which is uh, which is uh, um, which is um, uh, uh, described by the trade openness indicator, um, because uh, uh, it, uh, because uh, its openness relatively high, and uh, Poland uh, belongs uh, uh, to the group of countries uh, within the EU that are more dependent on international trade. And uh, also, there is also what about Polish exporters? Uh, we just they uh, they uh, we should focus on uh, to improve their comparative advantage, but also the um, Polish exporters should uh, should uh, uh, should compete not only uh, should improve uh, should compete not only using prices, but also uh, should focus on uh, non-price comp uh, competition. And this is the indicator for our exporters. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Professor Jimbawa. As you mentioned, as you mentioned before, uh, the foreign direct investment are very important in terms also of exports. And <clears throat> in those in this context, I would like to ask Professor uh, Umiński, what are the main determinants in attracting the FDA to Poland and how it changed since 2004? It keeps quite important role also in uh, uh, international research to uh, directly point what are the key uh, features of the economy that is so attractive uh, for foreign uh, investors. So Professor Ominski, the floor is yours. So first of all, I would like to thank you for that question. So answering this question undoubtedly uh, requires a, a quick look into the motives that drive the uh, foreign direct investors' locational choices. So let us uh, briefly investigate into the classical taxonomy by John Dunning. So investors are resource seekers. So they are looking for very specific resources ranging from physical ones like oil and gas to unskilled or skilled or semi-skilled labor and technological and managerial capabilities. Secondly, investors are seeking for the market to supply their products. They are also uh, efficiency seeker, which means that they are going to gain from common governments of geographically dispersed activities through economies of scale and, and scope, and, th and they are going to have the benefits of different factor endowments of uh, different specific countries. And last but not least, they are looking for strategic assets and capabilities. So Poland, together with Hungary and Czechia, uh, can be counted as front runners in opening up to foreign direct investments. In general, the basis of the comparative advantage of Poland as a country attracting foreign direct investment were and are a large and absorptive market, which was uh, growing fast after the economies of shortages. The term is uh, coined by Janusz Kornight uh, to uh, describe the centrally planned economy. Of course, the economy of Poland and the other countries of the region are still growing fast. Uh, another attractiveness factor is cheap and relatively productive and skilled labor force. So we can call it a talent pool, which gains in importance when it comes to the uh, assessment of the uh, uh, foreign direct investment attractiveness. We have to also mention the geographical proximity to European markets, which uh, undoubtedly reflects the forces of gravity. Very often we are forgetting about the forces of, of gravity. That's the concept incorporated into economics from physics, as we know. And uh, in one word, the closer we are to each other, the more, the more intensive FDI and trade flows we have and uh, of course membership in the EU. It is a very important factor that positively contributes to the investment attractiveness. It, uh, it guarantees access to the EU internal market and safeguards the rule of the law. So much important for the stability of the investment climate. If initially the motive of market seeking dominated, then over time, Poland, and other countries of the region began to clearly play a role of the export-oriented manufacturing platform based on relatively low labor costs. So we are uh, speaking here about the efficiency-seeking type of FDI. Recently, FDI have been subject to further changes. So we observe the growing share of services sector in FDI. And also FDI uh, are, in, in, are increasingly uh, relying on reinvested <laughs> profits. So the transformation towards the higher value added is underway. An increasingly important factor in investment attractiveness of Poland is access to highly qualified creative talent pool capable of uh, uh, providing higher added value. A very good example is knowledge intensive business services sector in Poland. The Association of Business Service Leaders report, I mean the ABSL, uh, clearly shows the importance of the talent pool for the investment attractiveness of Poland. Poland, so what is specific about Poland when it comes to the investment attractiveness for FDI? 
scale matters. Other countries of the region can offer similar benefits, but scale of Poland is bigger. However, the investment climate and perception of Poland as, as a place of doing business might deteriorate if the political and legislative turmoil will continue. And undoubtedly, invasion of Russia to Ukraine also negatively affects the investment climate in Poland. So the stability of, of Poland, I mean, the rule of the law and the, and the stability of the micro, microeconomic situation is becoming more and more important as it is assessed by foreign direct investors. Uh, when it comes strictly to the uh, consequence of the membership in the European Union, on the figure, there is shown the inward FDI stock in USD millions. So uh, there's a line showing 2004. So we can uh, see that around the date, I mean, the date of the entrance into the EU, in Poland and in uh, Czechia and in Hungary, the uh, inward FDI stock of uh, uh, incoming foreign direct investment increased. However, when we are talking about a success of Poland in terms of attracting FDI, we have to be conscious that we can use many different indicators or indices. So when we compare the inward FDI stock in USD per capita, so we can clearly see that Poland is not so highly ranked. However, we have to remember that uh, small economies as Estonia, Czechia, uh, Czechia uh, Slovakia, and, and Latvia, for example, are much more open economies. So we are having the phenomenon that small economies are much more open. So we have to be careful while we are comparing the countries and we have to use many, many uh, different indicators showing from different perspectives a success in attracting of FDI. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, for your answer. There were a lot of uh, things that we can also then mention maybe in uh, conclusions, and it shows how close is the relation between trade, between the presence of the um, of the direct investors, and the scale of the um, of the activities that are undertaken in uh, um, in Poland. But uh, let's be more detailed and go into regional perspective, uh, because we have today with us uh, an expert in terms of attracting FDI to the regions, uh, Mr. Wojciech Tyborowski. And I would like to ask you from your um, experience, uh, can you please tell us how effective is Pomorskie in terms of attracting FDI? And uh, what are the advantages so specific uh, uh, in our region uh, that we are popular or less popular that we can have? What are the uh, absorptive capacities of our region to attract FDI? So please, uh, Mr. Tyborowski, the floor is yours. So uh, attracting FDI is actually to the region, actually let's say regional attract FDI is about um, taking what my distinguished predecessors has described uh, and put that into practice. Uh, therefore, the effectiveness of Pomorski values uh, in attracting FDI is based on a uh, scientific process. We actually made the research 10 years ago. Pomorski entered the game entered the, the market of attracting FDI quite late. Uh, in the first decade of the 21st century, Pomorski was lagging behind the Southern Poland, Central Poland, uh, Wojewodzic like Małopolski or uh, Donoszlonski were much more successful in the first years of the 21st century in attracting foreign companies. Uh, in our region, we decided that we have to change something about it. We have to do something about it and we conducted research. Research was actually about the demand and supply. Demand, what the global companies are looking for, what they actually would like to buy. Uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Uminski mentioned that, those, uh, that the companies are seeking for efficiencies for the market, they're looking for the uh, proximity or some, or some uh, geographical advantages. So we did a research on that, uh, and we also did the research on our 
advantages. We also did, made a scan of what are the assets of Morsky Voivodeship in terms of the know, natural resources, uh, strategic assets, or uh, the talent pool that we can offer. And we looked for the, for the areas when those interests of the global companies and those assets that we have in our region match. And this is what, where we base on our strategy. So this, is, this approach is called sector-based uh, strategy. Uh, we focused right now our uh, efforts in attracting FDI on five sectors. This is business services also. Uh, Mr. Professor Ruminski mentioned those IT, which might be included in those business services, the offshore wind, uh, the automotive sector in terms of the e electric mobility, elect electric mobility, email mobility, and manufacturing of semiconductors. It's based on actually the, the set of sectors has changed over time because also the demand of the global companies also shift. Uh, this is Ms. Professor uh, mentioned uh, that over the last 20 years, we saw evolution. What the companies are looking for, we'll see that, uh, that those needs are changing. This is something that we that uh, also changed on our side. Poland, of course, right? We still have an advantage of the labor arbitrage, so we still uh, offer the relatively uh, or actually quality talent on a relatively lower prices. Let's put it like that, uh, and it's still something that it, that drives foreign companies to Poland. But comparing to what what we were offering like ten years ago. We see the huge difference that we, we are attracting right now more advanced or complex investment because we can offer a more qualified talent. Uh, and this is something what we what is a root in our strategy that we constantly monitor the demand, constantly monitor the needs of the global companies and. On the other hand, we constantly try to develop our product. This is how we call out the region and what we offer to the investors. So we constantly look for the new niches or new opportunities that we offer to our investors. Of course, we to be successful in it, we need to run a uh, efficient uh, promotion, promotional campaigns. And this is something one one area that we try to excel. Uh, and well, and basically that's it. So these are our uh, the roots, which are the cornerstones of our strategy uh, and how we try to be effective in attracting foreign direct investment. So promotional activities and constant look for the business opportunities for the global for the global companies and constant monitoring in the in in those changes in their demand. Thank you very much. So as we can see, you all started with the orientation in terms of strategy towards investors in regions from surveys and research to bring the demand and maybe a possible uh, supply together. And on this basis, probably taking into consideration some advantages of the region, because you mentioned the IT, uh, which is closely connected with the uh, specific of the region in terms of higher education also because these are the, the, these are the strengths also of our region but also the localization which we have the off uh, uh, offshore wind uh, uh, sector these are the parts of our strengths in the region so you keep on with the with the strategy what uh, and somehow you try to uh, manage the change all the time uh, and face the uh, the current uh, changes and uh, challenges thank you very much uh, so we will move slowly to the second round of question which is a little bit different because i was inspired to prepare this uh, kind of maybe general question but it can be addressed to uh, all my three distinguished guests today uh, which is connected with the economic forum in Davos, which took place uh, this year. Uh, during this um, uh, forum, uh, Alexander Stapp, former Finnish prime minister, said that the world's answer to deglobalization will be closer regional cooperation in form of deeper trade and investment agreements. 
Uh, I am a researcher in terms of FDI and trade also. And I remember our first discussion in 2020 with Professor Uminski, how it will change, how, how the process will uh, differ from this, uh, what we used to um, face in terms of FDI and trade. And I'm very interested, what do you think? How uh, this process may impact, is it possible uh, to change something in terms of FDI uh, agreements and trade agreements. Uh, do we have still space to deeper the integration? Is there anything we can still go beyond what we uh, have? And I would like you to put the, uh, the layer of Poland and uh, Polish region perspective. So uh, maybe I will ask first this time Professor Uminski, and then as a discussion, you can also um, uh, just take part in the dis discussion. So Professor Uminski. So I must first admit that I find this question somehow provocative. Does the globalization uh, mean the end of globalization? Well, indeed, there is some kind of lively discussion on this issue in the literature and in the public sphere. So undoubtedly the economic landscape has changed. It has become more vibrant and unpredictable. Uh, un Black swans came and changed the societal and economic conditions in which foreign, di foreign direct investments uh, operate. These results in demand for deglobalization indeed so this question is serious. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's about the change of the paradigm after the era of post-war liberal consensus. So Naomi Klein lists several reasons that justify deep skepticism about uh, 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 globalization. So these are the inequalities, uh, fragility, encouragement of wastefulness and environmental damages. On the other hand, Peter Buckley with uh, Niron Hashai, they sketch the potential negative consequences of anti-globalization. So multinational enterprises are knowledge, uh, knowledge creators. So they have the unique uh, capability of transferring sophisticated firm uh, embodied techno technological knowledge internationally. So, uh, globalization or even anti-globalization can reduce these transfers and it will change or even deteriorate the competitive position of many nations on the technological ladder of the of the of the global economy so uh, regionalization will not be easy firms are tied to crucial global hubs for manufacturing logistics and finance so replicating these hubs would be a serious undertaking which may uh, bring severe costs and the question is if the final consumers uh, be eager to pay these higher costs that's the question i think that we will observe a journey towards regional globalization this issue has been addressed by UNCTED in the World Investment Report 2020. So within the European Union, the stress will be on the supply chain resilience. Resilience is the word uh, very frequently repeated in the public debate now on the, on the globalization issues and on the FDI agenda as well. So regionalization is already occurring in the United States with a purpose to decouple from China. So we have an example of how, how this could be going on. I think that we can expect intense, intensified intra-regional foreign direct investments within the EU and FDI relocations, which means onshoring and insourcing. All of these changes are expected to work in favor of strategic regional autonomy for the European Union. So I think we are uh, and we will be having a shift from the efficiency seeking investment to regional market seeking type of FTI. I think that the new investment development path is likely to emerge from global towards regional value chains. Undoubtedly, there will be some rising tensions between efficiency and resilience in global value chains in the post COVID-19 world additionally affected by the consequences of the Russia invasion to Ukraine. The question is, will Poland benefit from this regionalization? 
Poland is in fact in a very good position to benefit from the uh, changes I've already mentioned. Being in the European Union, a part of the European internal market in geographical, cultural, mental vicinity of countries that are big FDI players, Poland will probably attract new FDI projects and will be a favored location to reinvest uh, earnings. However, some conditions must be fulfilled. The world has become vibrant. Competition for FDI is and will be tougher. Poland is a country bordering Ukraine invaded by Russia, and energy prices in Poland have dramatically increased. So Poland is or, or might therefore be losing some of its investment advantages. For, for Poland, the, the crucial thing is to provide stable legislative and economic environment, including microeconomic stability. Pomorskie is resilient, is open, has a very open economy. It's, it's one of the uh, most open regions in Poland, o offers a talent pool and has been highly ranked as a favorite location for services, especially for knowledge intensive business services. However, the question is, is, is very difficult to be answered because, in my opinion, the picture is not perfectly clear. On one hand, we are and will be having reshoring, diversification, regionalization, and replication. But it all offers both challenges and opportunities. So we will have restructuring of the international production configuration. So, we will have some relocations, divestment, FDI diversions, and so on. It can postpone some FDI projects. It can accelerate the other ones. It will mean some changes on the FDI locations map globally and within Europe and originally. It creates chances for new locations like Poland and Pomorskie <laughs> because investors will be looking for places in which the supply base can be diversified, uh, secured, in order to, uh, to gain resilience and redundancy. The pool of efficiency seeking FDI will reduce, it will increase competition for FDI, but it offers a chance for locations like Poland and like Pomorski for market seeking foreign direct investments. Thank you very much. Uh, and maybe, uh, the first, maybe I will ask you to add something from the regional perspective, because uh, Professor Uminski mentioned some uh, features of the um, of our region uh, that is uh, attractive uh, for investor. How do you see those threats uh, in the context of further deeper integration and the interest of uh, investors in the future? Well, truly, we live in interesting times because the change is happening in front of our eyes. What Mr. Ruminski said, yes, from on one end, the global companies are pushed toward uh, this more regional world. So yes, looking for the market efficiencies. On the other end, there are factors that are preserving the status quo. For example, the pandemics, uh, everybody in the beginning were saying, okay, this is a time to move production from China to Europe to US. Uh, the uh, German Chamber of Commerce actually made a, uh, made a research uh, among their members uh, and like 60% of the companies was thinking about moving back the production to, uh, to Europe. Uh, actually, after two years, they, they asked some companies, hey, did, what did you do about it? And only 11% of companies actually made some changes, not even bringing back production to Europe, but they changed some suppliers, they changed some subcontractors, they did just some minor changes. The problem is for the global companies is that right, it's happening so much around the war in Ukraine, uh, is that uh, the, the inflation rate is, uh, the wage rates are going, uh, going up, the interest rates are going up, so it, actually creates a lot of uncertainty. So everybody is talking about it. Everybody is discussing the what should be the next steps, but we don't see as much push for the next steps. We don't see as much movement around. Uh, on the paper, it seems very logic to this regional, this concept of the more regional world uh, that the, those regions are far more integrated 
within themselves and somehow just loosely connected to the, to the other uh, centers of activities. But this global work and actually the lack of certainty, the lack of the uh, idea how the world will look like in a one year or two years time stops the companies to, from, from making any major moves. Although I do believe that we uh, should expect to change. Maybe it will take longer. Maybe it will not happen over like next three, four, five years. But yes, we should in some longer time, we should, we should see some movement. Uh, and what we actually, we kind of incorporated that into our strategy. The semiconductors is actually the, why we focus on this sector is actually an example that we, we actually believe that this sector will change its, how it's, uh, how it's a global value chain is structured, that those, uh, those components will have to manufacture on the local market. It's, it's actually no secret because although there are only a couple of global corporations who are involved in this, uh, in this process and they already announced such plans. So yes, we are working on it so that part of this global value chain will be in the future located in the uh, in our region. So this is something that we are we firmly believe in. However, I would say that uh, we'll not see the major change uh, over the next like two or three years. Well, thank you very much uh, from this uh, from for this comment. And Professor Timba, can you shortly please refer to any uh, things that came up uh, to your mind connected with the trade, trade in Poland, trade of Poland, and those trade linkages between Poland and the global economy? Uh, so, so to make to make my contribution to this very interesting discussion, I think that we could adopt much more. Um, wide perspective because uh, my uh, my uh, famous guests uh, mentioned about uh, changes in the global supply chain. For sure, these this changes would happen. Of course, at the moment we do, we, do, we do not really know the scale, the in intensity of those changes, the direction of these changes. But of course, uh, there are some scenarios uh, concerning what what the what what would be the situation of Poland. Uh, for sure, maybe uh, for sure, uh, uh, Poland could b benefit from the relocation, from the changes in the global supply chain, uh, because, uh, uh, the, um, as it was mentioned earlier, uh, has some assets, so has some assets like very high, relatively high competitiveness, you no know, high competitiveness, as it was proved on the uh, uh, according to the global competitiveness index from the 2019. Uh, Poland, uh, prepared by World Economic Forum, Poland took uh, uh, 37 position, and uh, so it was, uh, of course, uh, it was not so bad anymore because it was a very good position uh, with regard to the other countries from Central Europe. And also, what are the, the strong factors? Uh, like uh, it was underlined, but it was uh, it was the, the data does not come from from today. Uh, underline. Uh, for sure, the human capital. So we have very uh, the quality of labor force is very high. Um, so the high competitiveness is uh, this positive in this context. Uh, the location factors, as it was mentioned, and the quality of labor labor force, which uh, could make Poland a very effective market uh, in the in these times of the, glo the globalization, regionalization, and. Uh, Oh, and the changes uh, with the global supply chain, um, because uh, uh, Poland belongs to countries with an average degree of involvement in the global value chain. chain, uh, chain. So uh, it could be, um, uh, so these this processes, uh, of course, uh, uh, could pose some, uh, could make some opportunities for Poland. And, uh, and uh, as it was mentioned earlier, there are some uh, there are some uh, areas, uh, so there are some industries which could be susceptible uh, to relocation, but of course the, the future is unpredictable and uh, uh, we could uh, predict some changes, but of course at the moment we, we do not really know what will happen, but it takes time, it takes many years, so it's a long-term process. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And I, I would like to move to the final questions. Uh, according to the situation that we are facing since 2020, uh, already in 2020, at the end of 2019, when the COVID outbroke, uh, we, all of us, because we focus on those international uh, issues uh, in economy, we were discussing this change of the rules. Uh, and I'm very interested about your opinions um, in terms of trade and FDI. Uh, what are the prospects for Poland uh, in terms of trade? Because there are changes, changes that are taking place. And of course, um, the same situation is uh, within the FDI, how our situation will uh, change in terms, for example, um, of competing for FDI in this race for FDI, but also how to keep the uh, advantages, this competitive advantage uh, of our trade. And I will have a little bit different question to Director Tiborowski, but I will try to, I would like to leave it at the final uh, stage. So maybe Professor Jimbawa, could you start with the trade as a result of your uh, first uh, uh, um, comments? Uh, just to start, if we could uh, say uh, that uh, pandemic uh, in the global, just to start with the pandemic, the global scale bring about the destabilization in many spheres, just production, investments, uh, demand, logistic, functioning of the global supply chain, cooperation, and uh, direct contacts, business and social uh, relation. And uh, of course, it uh, changes the environment in which uh, the companies operate. What about, uh, what about Poland? And what, what the situation uh, of Poland uh, during the pandemic? Uh, so, uh, so Poland uh, belongs in the group of countries that, uh, best, that survived the turmoil caused by pandemic. Uh, taking into account the current microeconomic indicators and the position of Poland is relatively good, although at the same time uh, there are some serious challenges, threats and problems in, in the functioning of enterprises and, uh, and uh, its international economic uh, links. And uh, uh, so the good performance of our country is influenced in particular by the exports of goods and services. So, uh, so it's dynamic uh, during the pandemic is higher than GDP growth rate. So therefore exports could be regarded as a driver of economic growth during the pandemic. Yes, uh, and Poland uh, experienced of course, uh, uh, like the other countries, a short decline in export activities, which only occurred uh, in the second quarter of 2020. And then uh, exports, uh, uh, the situation of Polish exports is, is rather, is rather, is rather, rather promising. Is rather promising, and uh, of course, uh, um, um, it is uh, also maybe due to the fact uh, that uh, the uh, that uh, the commodity structure of Polish exports is uh, very diverse, diversified, and of course, uh, so it means uh, so it means mean, means uh, that uh, it is possible. Uh, to compensate for decline in some sectors with increase in the others. And uh, what, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what the situation of Polish exporters, how do, how do they ev uh, evaluate uh, their prospects and uh, all the situation which happened during pandemic. And so we, we have conducted a survey and a study covering just, just to underline covering uh, period March 2020, uh, till uh, July uh, 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 2021, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and this survey was uh, research was carried out uh, uh, on the on the on on the sample of Polish exporters, and uh, um, we asked them what was the impact uh, of pandemic on this on the industries in which they operated. So the Polish exporters, when assessing the impact of the pandemic on the industries in which they operate indicated a negative uh, or at most natural impact of the pandemic. Of course, uh, however, there were some exporters that uh, reported that uh, their they reported some positive uh, effects. So it's natural because for some exporters at the beginning, it was a shock uh, to operate in such turbulent times, in such, such turbulent conditions. However, 
the pandemic didn't significantly affect uh, the value of foreign uh, sales of, uh, of our exporters. Uh, uh, so this, uh, this was reported by more, uh, by more than 50% of uh, Polish exporters. So the situation in this context is rather po uh, positive, according to our uh, studies. And uh, lower uh, export results during the pandemic than forecasted forecasted were achieved by one third of Polish exporters. And the question, and also we're wondering whether they took any active steps to increase exports during pandemic. Uh, so, uh, so the activities which were, which were undertaken by Polish exporters uh, included the search for new contractors, clients, and the intensification or introduction of new uh, promotional activities. Uh, but the, this, these activities were not so active activities. So uh, just to sum up the results of our studies conduct, uh, indica, uh, in, indica, uh, in, uh, indicate that uh, on, uh, on the one hand, uh, the diversified impact of the subsequent phases, just because we can keep in mind that the uh, impact that uh, the pandemic has uh, had different phases and they, in terms of its intensity, uh, so so uh, we, we can take into account the diversified impact of the subsequent phases of the pandemic on, of ex on export activities. And on the other hand, the effectiveness of the adaptation measures undertaken by the Polish companies to the condition determined by the pandemic, although as I was underlined, they weren't uh, active measures supporting foreign expansion. And what about the for, uh, future prospects, about the prospects? Uh, so, Polish, so the Polish exporters, despite the difficulties related to the pandemic and in fact its negative impact on the functioning of, on many, of many industries and uh, uh, the decline in the value of export transactions positively uh, assesses their current exports uh, opportunities, conditions and prospects for foreign expansion. These results um, gives us very optimistic picture of the Polish export uh, sector, although the situation is very dynamic and requires constant observation and quick responses. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, so, so, so the study sh shows uh, shows uh, that uh, the, so that the Polish uh, ex that uh, Polish uh, companies are very uh, uh, those companies which are exporting are quite resilient. Yes in this turbulent time. But of course, we can keep in mind that uh, this, uh, this, this observation uh, were uh, taken on the basis of study uh, covering years March 2020 and uh, uh, July 2021. So of course, uh, maybe there, 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 there were some changes after, after, this, after this period of research. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Jimbella. This is very, that was very interesting. Of course, we have to keep in mind that the situation changed again, unfortunately. Uh, so we have another factor uh, heavily impacting our uh, situation in Poland, uh, which is the Russian invasion to Ukraine. And uh, we are facing also our internal problems uh, connected with the exchange rate, uh, with the problem with the uh, public finances, uh, which may change also the situation in terms of uh, FDI. We are facing now the slow, uh, slowdown uh, uh, in, um, in our economy, but also uh, globally. And uh, I would like to ask uh, for some comments in this uh, future, for maybe some kind of foresight for FDI in Poland, uh, Professor uh, Uminski, can you please make? Uh, any suggestions or ideas how it may look like in the future? Well, as I have already said, uh, the changes are uh, occurring very quickly. The competition for FDI is becoming harder and harder. So I'll repeat it again and again. In these very vibrant, unpredictable economic circumstances, Poland must provide for the investors very stable legislative environment and microeconomic environment as well. I mentioned here the coherence between the fiscal and monetary policy, so we know that it is a drawback of Poland. I also see some chances for the investment development path. I mean that we could expect 
or at least there is some place that the Polish foreign direct investments would be growing. It's in line with the IDP. Uh, but of course, as it was uh, mentioned many, many times here, uh, the world is changing. I, I see some, I see some uh, possibilities that the investment climate in Poland will deteriorate, unfortunately. Although I was uh, telling the story that the talent pool in Poland is our advantage, however, uh, if we look into world talent ranking uh, in IMD World Competitiveness Center for the 2021, so we could see that the uh, assessment of the uh, of the um, talent uh, pool of Poland is deteriorating over the years. So undoubtedly, we need a lot of uh, thinking about changing the educational system in Poland to make the talent pool more strong and to be more innovative just to fulfill the expectations of foreign direct investors. Thank you very much. And I will move to my final question. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, at the beginning of our meeting, we are within the project and our colleagues from Western Balkans are looking forward uh, for any hints that you can give to regional authorities that you can share about the know-how, about the lesson learned, how to deal with the process of integration, how to attract investment. And maybe can you please tell us uh, how, because you mentioned already about the changes in the strategy, uh, in the timeline uh, since many years um, in our region, but I would like to ask you directly how it changed when we had to face the pandemics and now the uh, war uh, in Ukraine, how it changed or did it change at all uh, with your um, strategy towards foreign investment and please uh, just can you share any uh, lesson learned and good practice uh, from our regional perspective with our colleagues from Balkans? I would be very grateful for this. So, uh, starting from the maybe first, I would say rule, maybe not a good practice, a rule. Uh, the, the rule is if the, the times are bad, you need to work twice as hard. Uh, we actually, back in 2019, uh, we kind of shifted our, maybe not we change our strategy, but we add another factor to it because uh, in 2019, it came out from our analysts well, because we are of course monitoring the, the state of the global economy. It came, it came out that the, there is a high possibility for the slowdown in 2020 and upcoming years. Uh, it was based on the, mostly on how the uh, flows of the global uh, for direct investment, we're behaving between like 2006 and 2019. We see the drop uh, every year. We see we, we saw the drop in the uh, global flows of the uh, direct investment. Just we kind of assume, okay, maybe the next years will not be as good as the uh, uh, as those that are in the past. Uh, just we started to prepare the organization. Uh, if you need to work twice as hard. Uh, and you can't make people actually work 16 hours per day because it's counterproductive and illegal. Uh, therefore, you need to also, you know, strengthen your organization. It's something that we started to uh, started doing in 2019. Uh, and uh, actually, when the pandemic broke out in 2020, uh, we kind of it kind of went the same way we we assume. So the global economy really slowed down. The number of uh, foreign direct investment actually dropped by 50% or something like that, according to UMTAD. Uh, therefore, and we are in the, in the process of increasing our activity uh, because attracting foreign direct investments is first you need to reach out to the companies, go out, be, be active, uh, make contact with them. And in the bad times, you need to make contact with twice as many companies as you did before. So what the pandemic also uh, required from us was to change our the tools that we are using. So we could not have done it over the economic missions. We could not have done the uh, conferences, events, some, something like that. We had to sh move that uh, to the virtual world. We have to we have to do it in an online manner. So we had to learn how to run webinars, semi, uh, I don't know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, 
uh, Zoom talks, stuff like that. And this is something that we had to uh, incorporate and it stayed with us. Right? Many of our initial contacts with the global companies are, are still online and sometime in the, along the process when they are more interested, they are coming to the region and uh, having a visit here, which of course is some like one step closer to the final decision about investing in the region. Uh, and the second rule that, you, that we also incorporated or actually embraced over the pandemic is uh, if you feel bad, go for a checkup frequently. Meaning we really invested in our uh, analytical capacity. So we uh, pay closer attention to what's happening on, in the world. Uh, the pandemics, the war actually provided a lot of new information that has to be processed. This is something that we really right now pay attention to. So we really check what's going on, what are the trends, what are companies thinking about, uh, and we try to adjust ourselves in the real time to those changing demands. Uh, and I would say these are right now the two most important practices that probably everyone looking for the foreign direct investment should incorporate. So be in line in what's with the changing world and the, and the, change, and the world is changing rapidly. So you have to be able to get those information, process them and adjust your uh, activities to, uh, according to the changing demand of the global companies. Thank you very much. Mm, thank you for your all comments. Uh, I would just ask if you want to make any uh, further remarks. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for your engagement. I would just say that we started the discussion about European integration, about the trade uh, of Poland, about the FDI and attractiveness of Poland. But the thing that I put in my notes was that we are facing the times of the change management uh, because we have to adapt, we have to adjust our strategies, uh, not only on the macro level from the political point of view or just managing the uh, policies, but also for the regional authorities and, of course, entrepreneurs, which stand behind all uh, our successes on this uh, economic terms. Of course, Poland is very successful in terms of uh, export and uh, this competitiveness of uh, Polish trade, but there is still a lot of things to do because Professor Jimbawa mentioned that um, the changes which are taking place in the structure of the Polish uh, export are just very uh, small or just uh, not that um, making such huge impression that we uh, could do. We have still the uh, potential to uh, go into the direction of knowledge and technology uh, intensive uh, um, exporting. The very similar situation is uh, within the FDI, the portfolio of FDI incoming to, um, to Poland is very diversified and we are still looking for some uh, specialization. However, a very positive uh, view showed us today, Mr. Tyborowski, who showed that the strategy towards uh, uh, investors should be uh, shaped by some advantages of the regional economy and it may be uh, some uh, good practice and good, uh, good hint for our colleagues from Balkans that we should start with looking for our advantages and then in this context uh, prepare uh, our uh, strategy. There is a lot of challenges that our uh, economy will face also not only in the um, external uh, or from the external global scene, but also uh, in the internal uh, aspect. But I hope that we will go through the storm oils and uh, in next two years, we will have the discussion. How did we adjust to the situation since uh, 2020 and what are the key, uh, key factors that um, we were so successful in Poland? For today, I would like to thank you uh, to my distinguished guests, uh, which were today with me. Uh, Professor Dzimbiała from University in Katowice, uh, uh, Mr. Tyborowski from uh, Polish Agency 
of Investment and Trade, uh, which is uh, located in, uh, in Pomerania, and my colleague from University of Gdańsk, Professor Uminski. Thank you for, uh, for you, for your engagement, and for your uh, highly valued expertise uh, in your fields. Thank you very much, and I hope we will see uh, in some other conferences and meetings. Thank you very much.